On Friday, February 19th, many of Arizona's best-known dignitaries gathered at the Arizona Biltmore to honor their own. Unique individuals who have left an indelible mark on the pages of Arizona history. This is the 1993 History Makers Gala. Our history maker, Edward Bud Jacobson. Our history maker, William Bill Kayakawa and his wife Marge. Our history maker, Dwight Pat Patterson and his wife Ruby. Our history maker, the Honorable John J. Rhodes and his wife Betty. Our history maker, the Honorable John R. Jack Williams and his wife Vera. Cameron Harper from News Channel 3 welcomed the evening's participants, and Father Francis Moore of Brophy Prep gave the benediction. Following the dinner, the host, Phoenix lawyer Grady Gamage, began the presentation. I would like to remind all of you that this is Statehood Month, and so it's fitting that we recognize the contributions of these great Arizonans tonight, Irma, Bill, Bud, John, Jack, and Pat, and seeing as how we're a first name society, I'm not going to mention last names, but it's fitting that we honor them for the wonderful contributions they have made uh, to this state. Uh, they have such uh, diverse talents. Their careers uh, have uh, been very different, but very powerful in their contributions to making us what we are as a great state. And for me, it's an honor to uh, deliver both a personal and a uh, statewide congratulations to each uh, to each of them by proclamation uh, I bestow upon each of you and uh, to each of your fellow charter members the 92 honorees as well the title in honor of Arizona history maker congratulations and Arizona salute you let's see the first video and let me introduce you to this evening's first Arizona history maker Well, I don't remember it, <laughs> but I was, I was born September 18, 1916. That's what my mother tells me, at least. I have a, an older brother and an older sister, and so I was sort of a, an afterthought or, or no thought at all. John J. Rhodes, Jr. Known for 30 years as an unassuming but very effective congressman, Mr. Rhodes was born and educated in Kansas. In those days, Kansas State was the Kansas State College of Agriculture and Applied Science. And uh, they were not supposed to have a business administration school, but they did. Uh, but you sort of had to put it together. And uh, the dean of uh, general science was uh, a very capable man. I told him uh, early on that I wanted to be a lawyer. And so he said, well, let's put the curriculum together for you so that you'll have uh, both pre-law and, and business. So that's what he did. It worked out very well. Uh, the Depression came along in the 30s. and. And uh, I had no desire when I was about to graduate from Kansas State to go out and fool around in that job market and get something that I really didn't want to do anyway. So when Mother said, John, wouldn't you like to go to law school? I said, yes, Mother, I would like to go. So I applied at Harvard and Yale and, uh, and Michigan, and uh, the first one that I was selected by was Harvard. So that's where I went. After graduating from Kansas State College in 1938 and Harvard Law School in 1941, he was assigned to Williams Air Force Base, where his love for Arizona began. I was called to duty. I was an officer, uh, and I uh, had a commission uh, uh, in the infantry, actually. And uh, uh, so I was greatly surprised when I was called to active duty in the Army Air Corps. Uh, the Air Corps was expanding so rapidly. This was just before our involvement in World War II. And uh, they needed to release the pilots who were in administrative duties 
to train other pilots. And uh, we were uh, the cadre for two new bases, one at Victorville, California, and one at uh, Williams Air Force Base, which is then it was called ACAFS number seven, Higley, Arizona. And Betty and I were engaged by then. And uh, in fact, uh, we, uh, I'd been there about three days when Pearl Harbor came along, which was December 7th, of course. First job was, uh, I was a squadron adjutant. Phoenix was uh, a pretty good sized city. After all, I came from a town in Kansas with 2,300 people. And uh, so Phoenix looked like, like a real metropolis. And uh, Mesa was a beautiful little town, but uh, the, the whole valley was just charming as it could be, just uh, a, a, a sort of a resort area. I remember I would be officer of the day from time to time, and that, would, that meant, of course, that you were up all night. And the, the, the beauty of the, of the dawn over the superstitions was, uh, I think, the thing that, that really uh, Caused, caused me to feel that this might be God's country. <laughs> Betty and I were married in May of 42. We knew I was going to have to take the bar, so that I took the bar in January of 45 and passed that. So when uh, the war was over, we were ready to, uh, to, I was ready to practice law somewhere, mm -hmm. and I finally decided to, to do it in Mesa, and then one day of the week in Chandler. Prior to that time, we had decided to, to register to vote. Justice of the Peace in Chandler was a, a fellow named Jesse Cheek. And uh, so we went in and said, they said, what can I do for you, Major? Uh, I said, well, Mr. Cheek, uh, we want to register to vote. Well, fine. And he said, uh, you're registering as a Democrat. I said, no, we're registering as a Republican. He looked at me and he said, Major, you look like a nice fellow. Now, let me give you some advice. You're not going to amount to anything in this state as a Republican. <laughs> and uh, he said, I hope you'll change your mind and register as a Democrat. I said, Mr. Cheek, I appreciate your advice, but there are probably some things that my father will turn over in his grave for, but not this is going to be one of them. But I was interested in politics. My father was a, a county chairman in Morris County, Kansas, for years. And so I grew up in the, uh, the political climate, really. And later, he was... Uh, uh, state treasurer of Kansas. In November 1952, Mr. Rhodes became the first Republican ever elected to the House of Representatives from the state of Arizona. So we started a Young Republicans Club. And by 1950, we had enough to uh, uh, have a state convention. And we got Howard Pyle to, uh, to address our state convention. Well, he left, and about a half hour later, somebody got the bright idea of drafting Howard Pyle to run for governor. Anyway, Howard Pyle did win. But prior to that time, Barry had called me and uh, I had never met him before. So uh, he said, I'm drafting you to run for attorney general. So I said, well, you know, there's something you ought to know. I don't want to be attorney general. He said, there's something you should know. You won't be attorney general. <laughs> I said, this state is four to one Democrat. And I said, well, okay. And so with that understanding, all right, I'll run. <laughs> so. So that's uh, the way I got involved in politics, and and Howard won, and uh, and I didn't, but Howard and Barry and I got to be very good friends. When I was asked to run for the for Congress, we only had two, that two congressmen. I said I can't beat John Murdoch. Uh, congressman Murdoch had uh, two uh, opponents in the primary, and they really tore him limb from limb, on the basis that he was ineffectual. And so all I said was that um, I am. A Republican and uh, Dwight Eisenhower is going to be president of the United States and he needs me <laughs> so it worked <laughs> and um, so that I was able to, to win that one and then we went from there John Rhodes served as House Minority Leader from 1973 to 1980 after being elected to Congress for 15 terms and serving with eight presidents he retired in January of 1983 Mr. Rhodes was instrumental in getting funds appropriated for the Central Arizona Project. Had a lot of seniority by the time, well, I'm, I'm thinking of the time that the Central Arizona Project was authorized, which was 68. By that time, I'd been there for 16 years, and, uh, and Carl Hayden had been there for 55 years. Let's see, 1912, 56 years. And, uh, Stuart Udall uh, was Secretary of the Interior by then, 
Mo uh, was there. Mo and, and, and I were really the quarterbacks of the thing. The U.S. Reclamation Association named Mr. Rhodes Man of the Year in 1971. In 1982, the Vesta Club of Arizona honored him for his unselfish and untiring service on behalf of the Hispanic people of Arizona. John and Betty Rhodes are proud parents of John J. III, Thomas, Elizabeth, and Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, history maker John J. Rhodes, Jr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, history maker award this evening. Sure, go, come on, stand up. Good night. Mr. Rhodes, History Maker Award this evening is presented by one of last year's winners, Senator Barry Goldwater. Senator? Well, John, uh, you didn't run for Attorney General very hard, but you did a lot better. <laughs> and I just want to say that uh, I don't like war any more than you do or anybody else, but war has been very kind to Arizona. We've got a lot of people in here that we never would have gotten and you're one of them, and we're very, very proud of you, and I'm proud to give you this award, and I'm very proud of the years I spent serving with you in the Congress of the United States, and I have a hunch if we were back there, the country would be a hell of a lot better off. <laughs> Well, Barry, I, I suppose one of the most uh, important days of my life was that day that you called me at the office and said, listen, fella, I'm drafting you to run for attorney general, uh, because if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done it. And if I hadn't done that, I probably would not have uh, been in a position to go to the Congress. But anyway, you know, we've gone a long way together, and uh, I, we... Uh, I, I think the good Lord was uh, looking after me particularly when he sent me to Williams Field. Uh, Betty used to say, uh, uh, I, I wrote her and told her I was either going to South America or Higley, Arizona, and she said, I hope you're going to South America. I said, I, I know where that is. <laughs> but it all worked out so well, and uh, uh, I am very grateful, and uh, particularly grateful for the things that Arizona has done for us and uh, the, uh, the, the wonderful state this is. And uh, you natives have done a hell of a job in getting it done, Barry Goldwater. <laughs> and now let's meet Arizona's next history maker. I started law school at Northwestern Law School, my father's alma mater, in Chicago. And my health broke. I had had rheumatic fever and I had a relapse and had it again. I was told by the doctor to go west for law school. Edward Bud Jacobson. I had gone to grammar school in Chicago, and I'd gone to high school at the University of Chicago's laboratory school, a rather strange place that Bob Hutchins was trying to put his innovations in. I'd gone to Carleton College in Minnesota and Harvard Graduate School of Business in your hometown, and when I came out here, uh, I took all the winter quarters at the University of Arizona. The summer quarters, I went back home because the weather was all right and took them at Northwestern. When came time for graduation, I had an equal number of semesters in each school. Uh, I was second in my class at each school. Also known as Mr. Arizona Art, Mr. Jacobson was a partner in the law firm of Snell and Wilmer for more than 40 years. When it came time to graduate, the then dean of the law school here in Arizona was Byron McCormick. He later became president of the university, and he was the one who said to me, Bud, if you'd like to be, if you'll graduate from the University of Arizona, because you can graduate now from either law school, if you will graduate here, you can be the first law clerk in the history of the state to the Supreme Court, $256 a month take-home pay, and I said, I accept. It was absolutely wonderful. When I moved to Phoenix, I had no uh, relatives, I had no friends, I didn't even have any enemies. And uh, the three justices and their wives simply adopted me as surrogate parents. 
and nobody could be luckier or have had a more wonderful opportunity. From 1947 to 48, I was law clerk to the Supreme Court, and from 48 to 50, I was an assistant attorney general. Two years, I held that until I went to work for Frank Snell. And my first few months were under Fred Wilson, who was an attorney, the, the attorney general. And the rest of it was under Ivo DeConcini, Dennis and Dino Spock. The issues of the day were how to make the city grow. The state was almost totally democratic. There were no Republicans. The issues of the day were farming issues and rights to water. Water law was a very important thing in Arizona because there wasn't very much water. A man of diverse interests, Bud Jacobson has long been active in his support of Phoenix cultural endeavors. I was simply out here and there were a bunch of eager people wanting to make the town better and they, they sort of rung the dinner bell and we all helped and it was just, it wasn't glamorous, it was great. Those are different things. I've been president of the Hurt Museum for two terms, president of the Phoenix Art Museum for two terms, first vice president of the Phoenix Symphony. I headed the mayor's committee to redo Central Avenue recently. I was in charge of Terminal 3's art program at Sky Harbor. I was in charge recently of helping to get art for the new Supreme and Appellate Court building. I've had a, more than my share of wonderful opportunities for public art. I've put together a collection, the very first collection of Indian art for the Heard Museum. They never had any paintings at all. They had basketry, jewelry, and pottery. So that was fun to to participate in that beginning. A recipient of the Governor's Arts Award for outstanding individual contribution to the arts, Mr. Jacobson has twice received ASU's Distinguished Achievement Award, once from the law school and once from the College of Fine Arts. In 1979, I got a little bit interested in what business was not doing for the arts. And I looked around to see if there was a survey that could tell me where the dollars came into our organizations. Did it come from people or did it come from businesses? So there was no survey, so I made my own uh, of the Phoenix Symphony, the Art Museum, the Little Theater, the Zoo, the Herd. Well, about 10% came from businesses and about 90% came from individuals. See? So then, armed with my information, I thought, I've got to tell this to somebody. And the best way to tell anything to business is to get yourself booked as a speaker at Rotary 100. Well, it turned out that a group of businessmen here got the message. I think a little from my speech because the Republic printed the whole thing in full together with my charts. I haven't done a follow-up survey, but I understand now that business is very well represented in all of the charities, not just the arts and doing very well indeed. Named Man of the Year in 1975 by the Phoenix Advertising Club, Mr. Jacobson also served on the Arizona Arts Commission and chaired the committee which founded the Phoenix Arts Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, history maker Edward Bud Jacobson. Bud's History Maker Award this evening will be presented by Rudy Turk, the Director Emeritus of the ASU Art Museum. Rudy. Bud, a few centuries ago, the illustrious French Academy coined a word that applies to you. It is a word applied to anyone who becomes very involved with the arts as a student, collector, patron, and volunteer. That word is amateur. It derives from the Latin amare, and it translates not as amateur, but as lover. You're a lover, Bud Jacobson. You're a lover of the arts, the art of painting, the art of printing, all the arts, the arts of the turnwood bull. But more important, you are a master of the greatest art of all, the art of giving. You have given of yourself, your time, your interest, your property, 
your knowledge, and as a result, you are known throughout the state as Mr. Art of Arizona. It is a title that is given with great respect and enormous affection. And tonight we even top it, because tonight you have become history maker of Arizona. Rudy, I hope you wrote that out, because I don't have a single relative who will ever believe that. <laughs> it was beautiful, and I thank you. One quick word about early Phoenix. 46 years ago I got here, I was 24 years old. Uh, it was a small town filled with very big people. You think about them when you look back, and you don't look back often. This is one of the few times all of us tonight are looking back, not just the people who've been selected for awards, but the audience, too, who has made this town what it is. And I thought of all of the people who were my mentors, uh, my teachers, uh, and my friends, and I want to mention just two because you can't mention them all. But I was a partner with Frank Snell from 1950 to 1990 when I became of counsel. He wanted to be here tonight. Uh, I didn't want him to be here tonight. It's too rainy out. He's 93 years old and doesn't belong here tonight. But he's still popping along very wonderfully. The second is a man who is here tonight. And you saw the Colorado River coming down and heard about John Rhodes' very wonderful uh, contribution to making that happen. The man who won the lawsuit, probably the most important in the history of this state, Arizona versus the state of California before the United States Supreme Court, which brought the right to bring that water down, was Mark Wilmer. And I would like to say thank you to Mark, who is here also. Let's meet Arizona's next history maker. Well, first, I have never, had never at that time, been west of the Mississippi River. So when I was asked to speak, that really, that was one of, one of the reasons why I really wanted to come, because I was curious about the west. And, and, you know, is it true that there are cowboys and Indians and all this stuff? I was just like any other tourist. Irma Bombeck. So I brought my mother with me, and we had just left a blizzard in Chicago. We changed planes, had on the heavy coats. I mean, we were, we were dressed for Alaska. So we came out to Arizona, plane was late, landed just before midnight, and I walked out of, of Sky Harbor, and I saw these palm trees and this gentle, warm breeze just enveloped us and i thought i have come to paradise <laughs> send for the kids <laughs> that was it actually went home and i said to my husband let's move to arizona <laughs> i had never done that been speaking a long time went to a lot of places but never have i been to a place where i felt i belonged before. in june of 1971 irma husband bill daughter betsy and sons Andy and Matt moved from Dayton, Ohio to Phoenix, Arizona. We didn't, we weren't like Ozzie and Harriet. We didn't have these family council meetings and say, now children, mommy and daddy want to move out west. What, what do you think of that? Let's have a show of hands here. We, we didn't do anything like that. We just said, hey, we're moving. <laughs> this is going to be great. I think that your happiness is wherever your family is. Um, and all my family isn't even here now, but I know where they are. They're a phone call away. I, I think that's, that's mostly what it is. Honors for her books seem endless. From age 14, writing has been a part of her life. Her studies at the University of Dayton went hand in hand with writing ad copy and editing for weekly shoppers. Her first columns earned $3 each. Speaking to women's groups promoted her columns into national syndication. I don't think most people understand that that column they're reading appears not only in 800 newspapers throughout the country, but the books appear throughout the world. I don't think they realize that. They think, here's a woman who just, you know, bats this off, you know, before she takes her nap. That's it. Not true. Mrs. Bombeck was an original team member of ABC's Good Morning America and remained with the nationally televised show for 11 years. Humor has to be universal. It also has to be close to the truth. You get up there on a, on a tight wire without any clothes on. <laughs> 
and you do a balancing act and you walk across that wire very slowly and you could fall off in a bad taste, you could fall off the other side uh, for sensitivity. It's, it's a tough road out there and you're all by yourself and you're saying, look at me and laugh. And you're asking something pretty amazing from someone. Usually you're asking them to laugh at themselves and their own foibles, um, but you're asking them to take a chance with you. And it's such a good feeling when they laugh that you never question why. <laughs> <laughs> the Bombecks have been involved in a myriad of local endeavors and benefits. And we started out, we meaning uh, Bill and myself, we started out in this community. The first volunteer job we ever did was down at Salvation Army, filling up little boxes at Christmas. And then you go on, it's like an evolution. Anything that, that, that you feel you can bring some freshness to. And you have to keep fresh doing that. Whatever sort of needs fixing at the moment, uh, you name it. You know, we've been through March of Dimes, through the, the YWCA's, to, you know, and to all of it until currently. Um, I'm not doing as much for the Kidney Foundation. I will support them to the day I die because they're a great group. But now I'm moving on to another phase, which is um, um, uh, breast cancer, which I'm trying to get um, mobile mammogram units to go into South Phoenix and Indian reservations and try to pick up the cost of, of mammograms for disadvantaged people who can't afford them. Save a lot of lives. And, it, and I'm excited about it. The American Cancer Society received more than a million dollars for research from the proceeds of Irma's book about children surviving cancer. There was a need for a book to put in the hands of uh, children who were surviving cancer. They needed to know that someone was still living and beating the disease. They needed optimism and they needed a voice. They needed someone to give them a voice and say, this, this, this is the way I want people to treat me. This is what's on my mind. So that's all I was. I was an instrument for them. So I started to interview these kids and uh, boy, I was hooked. So I, I, I took the first three chapters in and I said, what do you, what do you guys think? They said, no, no, Irma, you gotta make it funnier. I said, what do you mean I gotta make it funnier? If I gotta make it funnier, give me lines. Come on, you guys, <laughs> you know, give me something to go on. Well, they did. They gave me their optimism. Uh, they gave me their feelings. And I followed these kids around for two years. It was a terrific experience. It's a very optimistic book. It makes you feel good. I'm glad I wrote it. Through columns, books, lectures, and television, Irma Bombeck's humor has provided hope for all who have been touched by it. I have a lot of hope for this state. I tell everyone, where else in this world can you go and have Barry Goldwater, Alice Cooper, and Irma Bombeck in the same neighborhood? I mean, does that bother your mind that we'd be on the same planet, let alone to be in the same neighborhood? And I, I, I like that idea. I, I, I like that a lot, and I hope, I hope it, it keeps its newness. The thing that attracted me to Arizona is that it is such a young state. It's something to build on. It's something to pull together. It, it's uh, to create. And I think that's what I love about the volunteerism, is that everything you do is going to be a part of this for a long time to come. And I like that idea of being a part of it. Ladies and gentlemen, history maker Irma Bombeck. You already discovered that I am not Cameron Harper. I am also not Irma Bombeck. Uh, Irma was taken ill today and is unable to be with us this evening. Bill Shover will be accepting the award. And presenting the award is one of last year's Arizona history makers, Mr. Pat McMahon. And God blessed us here in Arizona with Irma Bombeck. And I really meant that. I think that it was a spiritual thing because Irma falling into our midst was a breath of very special air from the Midwest and from across the country, from around the world, because everybody laughs at Irma. But the wonderful thing about that is, is having dealt in humor for so many years myself and having been privileged to make children laugh, what an extraordinary experience it is to know a woman who makes us laugh about children, that, that makes us understand our children, 
who brings warmth and sensitivity into our neighborhoods. And boy, I'll tell you, in a long, long time of doing dinners and awards, this is the best. So I present this now to Irma Bombeck. And I will confess that in the lexicon of life, there are too many uses of the word unique, and too often is it heard. But in the case of Irma Bombeck, it applies. There is only one Irma Bombeck. She couldn't be with us, and I, for that I regret. I will relay this award to her, and I know she's very pleased about this honor. Of course, Irma's here in spirit, and she says, I join all of you this evening in congratulating her good friends Bud and Bill and Pat and John and Jack, who have left their imprints on this state. The diversity of what we all do should escape no one. We all contribute some way. On behalf of Irma, you have honored her, and I thank you for Irma, Bill, and her family very much. Thank you tonight. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Pat. And thank you, most of all, Irma. Uh, and now, let's meet this evening's next Arizona history maker. Well, actually, I, I should have been born in Arizona, but there was no hospital in Ash Fork. So I was born in Los Angeles, California, but returned immediately to Arizona. John R. Jack Williams, the governor of Arizona from 1967 to 1975, Jack Williams was born on October 29, 1909. After a brief sojourn in Mexico, <clears throat> my father was Wells Fargo superintendent for the West Coast, but uh, Pancho Villa ran us out. My mother and I came out on a troop train and arrived in El Paso. My father was shipped out on a gunboat, and he joined us in El Paso, and the Wells Fargo gave him a job in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, as manager of their Phoenix uh, office. So we came to Arizona in 19, back to Phoenix in 1913, having spent about maybe a year, maybe less than that, out of the United States. From then on, I lived the usual childhood of, of kindergarten and grammar school and Phoenix Union High School, and then uh, finished junior college. After the junior college episode, which was only two years of college. I went to uh, KOI for an audition and was hired as an announcer. And I stayed with KOI with one brief exception when I was fired during the very depth of the depression. I stayed with them probably through almost 1960, uh, gradually buying more stock and finally winding up as one of the owners of the station. In 1942, he married Vera May. They became parents of two boys, Mick and Rick, and one girl, Nikki. For more than 40 years, his voice was one of the most familiar in Arizona. I did radio columns, which were very popular, for I don't know how many years. I know for sure from 1937 uh, on into the 70s. The popular columns I did on KOI were at 845 in the morning, which I uh, uh, always closed off with uh, another beautiful day in Arizona. Leave us all enjoy it. That was a tagline that attracted a lot of attention. And the reason I did that was because uh, I used to get out, used to mention on the program the weather, complain about it or something. And one day a guy said, You know, Jack, he said, uh, You shouldn't complain about the weather. It's always a beautiful day in Arizona. And that really struck me. So from then on, I wind up the broadcast. It's another beautiful day in Arizona. Leave us all enjoy it. And uh, during that time, I since I was very well known being the first radio announcer in Phoenix, uh, it was easy for me to get elected to various offices. I was the uh, continual uh, president of the Phoenix Elementary School Board for about eight years. He entered the community arena serving on school boards, as a lay leader in the Episcopal Church, as vice president of the Phoenix Housing Authority, and as president of the Phoenix Junior Chamber of Commerce. In 1946, he became a member of the Phoenix City Council. I served for almost two years on the City Council. I was not very happy with the job. I am more an executive than a legislator, and the compromises simply drove me mad. A couple of years later, a delegation of citizens asked me to run for mayor and persuaded me to do so. After serving as mayor for four years, I quit 
and went back to the radio station. And then, uh, by then, my, my associate had sort of become the top boss. Uh, he was, I didn't know at the time that he was dying, and he was very fretful and, and very uh, argumentative. And it became rather unpleasant to go to work in the morning. Uh, so when somebody asked me to run for uh, Paul Fannin, Senator Paul Fannin asked me to run for governor, and uh, Irving Jennings and many others asked me to run, I uh, made the fateful decision to run for governor. Uh, I was elected in uh, 1966 and took office in 1967. And then I served for uh, eight years. During the time I was serving as governor, the legislature changed the term from two-year terms to four-year terms. Understanding the importance of planning for the future, Governor Williams concentrated on orderly growth for the state. Long time, Arizona had been looking at the Colorado River. I finally got uh, the legislature being governor to start to prod our congressman. And uh, we actually began to plan to get water out of the Colorado River where we could take that water by canal to Tucson and we could help Canal County. We finally got the measure passed and uh, the canal is now, has reached Tucson. Well, most people never uh, think about when they turn on a faucet where the water comes from. Uh, only those who are in a leadership position in the legislature or in Congress uh, have any concept of the importance of uh, keeping a constant flow of water into an area. In my last four-year term, I was pretty tired out. So I simply quit. So it was in a, a heady time, and uh, while I was, my confidant while I was mayor was to increase the city of Phoenix uh, to, uh, to 500,000 people and make it a rather major city. And uh, when I was governor, we changed it entirely from a system of commissions and, and boards to a uh, modern uh, state government of uh, departments, department heads, <laughs> and uh, all that went on in that particular area. From the time he was in his teens, he loved writing columns, so his talent in communication was not limited to the airwaves. Columnist for local Phoenix papers, he eventually published his own weekly business and news journal, The Central Phoenix Sun. He still does frequent columns for publisher Henry Wick and has authored a collection of tales about mining in Arizona. The book is called From the Ground Up. This is Jack Williams on KOI Phoenix. It's another beautiful day in Arizona. Leave us all enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, history maker John R. Jack Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Governor Williams' History Maker Award this evening is Mr. Bob Goldwater. Jack, this is a great pleasure for me to do this, to give this to you. We've known each other since we've been in high school. And I'll have to say that all of the things they've talked about in your life, so far they, they all pale in comparison to the character that you have. That's the greatest thing that you can leave to Arizona. You have never, your word has never been doubted. You've always been trusted. People would trust you with anything you had to tell them, and they would be right. You, your life has been an exemplary one. I've never heard you say anything bad about anybody. And when anybody does anything good, you compliment them. You are, in my mind, a legend. You, you inspire people. If young people should look up to you and see what your character has meant to them. No, there's been so much said, and I appreciate uh, this honor so very much, and the evening is waning. I'm going to say thank you, and let's on with the show. Thank you, Governor. And now, let's see Arizona's next history maker. I was born in Oxnard, California, September 6, 1912. Parents and family, brothers and sisters, moved to Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, in the summer of 1929. William Bill Kachikawa, 
named outstanding alumnus of his alma mater. He has devoted countless hours to community service. In 1987, he celebrated the 50th anniversary of his graduation from Arizona State University. Attended Phoenix Union from 29, and my class was 19 and 33. And from there, I came to Arizona State, Tempe, in 1933 and my class, graduating class of 1937. Well, I was uh, mainly in sports, and I was involved in football and basketball and baseball. I, was, uh, I majored in education. Arizona State was originally named Tempe Normal, and most of the students, I think majority of the students were girls, ladies. Following his graduation, Bill Kachikawa joined the faculty as an associate professor in education and coaching. I was very happy that uh, I played for Coach Lavik, who was a disciplinarian and a humanitarian man of high ideals. And he gave me the opportunity to either stay there. So that's where I got started. Then we had classes for physical education majors. So we had classes in uh, football, basketball, baseball, track. And I helped in, in those classes. On June 15, 1941, Bill married Margaret Akimoto. We met in uh, Los Angeles, that's where she was living. And the war broke out in uh, December 41. But then around in 42, they activated the so-called 442nd, that, uh, that's a unit, a regiment composed of all Japanese Americans. You heard of that, and they had camps all over. So there was a request from many of the, our leaders, Japanese American leaders, that probably we shouldn't, uh, the, the government should form a special unit of all these fellows so they can prove their loyalty and and fight for their country. Uh, I think it was in 43, first of the year, they called for volunteers and quite a few came from the camps and volunteered, so I volunteered. And I think our unit, the 442nd and 100th, I think received seven presidential citations and that's supposed to be pretty good. The U.S. Army's noted 442nd Regimental Combat Team was the most decorated unit and was composed entirely of Japanese Americans. In 1946, Mr. Kajikawa returned to the staff at ASU, where he also received his master's degree in 1948. In the early years of ASU's athletic programs, Bill was a very busy man. Yes, I was head baseball, head basketball, same time, then I was in charge of the freshman program press classes. So I was with football from the time I started all the way. I was connected with it. In basketball, he was voted Border Conference Coach of the Year in 1954. The only Japanese-American head coach in major sports in any American college, Mr. Kajikawa was selected for the ASU Hall of Distinction as the ASU all-around coach. I retired in 78 officially, but then Coach Kush asked me to help in 78 and 79 to do a PR principally, go around the state and visiting this, the coaches and other people. It was partly recruitment, I guess. The American Legion chose William Kajikawa for its Americanism Award for service to young people. The Tri-City Catholic Social Service honored Bill and his wife, Margaret, with the Dorothy Mitchell Humanitarian Award, and the Tempe Community Council has recognized their dedication with its Don Carlos Award. Bill's efforts have ranged from coaching American Legion baseball teams to preparing VISTA volunteers for their future assignments. These uh, VISTA volunteers would come to these different schools like, and then there'd be many of us would take certain special areas where I gave them like uh, physical education for elementary school, teach them games and to organize and that sort of thing. And then they would go to another class, they would study about something else. And from here, they would be assigned to mostly Southwest, like the Indian Reservation. Bill and Margaret have two daughters, Carol and Christine. Carol O'Connell is an educator in California, and Christine Wilkinson is Vice President of Student Affairs at ASU. Bill's most recent recognition was from Arizona State University. His daughter participated in the ceremony as he received an honorary Doctor of Laws. Yes, that was a very high point. I never expected anything like that. And Christine got to read the uh, information, right? She got to read that. And then uh, Dr. Peck then announced that I would receive the degree and he gave all the information, what kind it was. 
And then he had Christine Hood me, which was a real honor. And that may not happen very often in the country. Just at the conclusion, then Dr. Peck then announced that, you know, Vice President uh, Wilkinson was the daughter of the recipient. And then there was quite a response there. So that made all of us feel good. Ladies and gentlemen, history maker, William Bill Kajikawa. To present the History Maker Award to a legendary coach, we have another legendary coach, Coach Dan Devine. Dan? Distinguished honorees, Bill's family. You know, there's an adage in coaching that probably the greatest compliment that you can pay a fellow coach is to say that you'd like to have your son play for him. And Bill, I want you to know that I wish my son had played for you. I want to say something about Mr. Grady Gamage here, and, and I want to pay my regards or respect for the late Grady Gamage Sr. Uh, he came to Arizona State the same year I arrived as a freshman, and he certainly provided the scholarship to help me along to bring me to this point. I want to thank the Historical Society for this opportunity, the selection, and the honor that was bestowed upon me. And I want to thank, of course, my family that stood by me all these years, all my friends, and of course, the many players I've had the pleasure of working with during my career. And some of the boys are in this room today. Thank you very much. We, uh, we have one more Arizona history maker to honor this evening, and so let us meet this evening's final Arizona history maker. My father came out from Ohio in about 1900. Everybody wanted to get out of Ohio in those days, and the West was just getting the Roosevelt Dam, and everybody going to have all the water they needed, so they, they all flocked in here. My uh, grandfather moved in about 1890 and established farming in the Kyrene district. My great-grandfather was the first chairman of the Kyrene school board. Dwight Pat Patterson. This longtime leader wears many hats, athletic, education, ranching, and conservation. And I was born in Tempe in 1912 in the Hackett House, which still stands. When I was six, we moved to Litchfield. My father was an electrician, and he uh, had charge of the pumps in the, at the Litchfield Ranch for, for the Southwest Cotton Company, which is Goodyear. And then we moved to Marinette, which is in Peoria. And then, so we stayed there for, and I was educated in the Peoria school. And after I got out of school, I went to High school, I went to college at Blackstone. Lettering in all sports at Peoria High School, he continued playing football while studying to become a high school coach and teacher at Arizona State Teachers College, now Northern Arizona University. He graduated in 1934. And I spent three years after I was graduated as freshman coach and assistant varsity coach for football. And then I moved down after I was married and moved down Mesa started farming. In 1938, he married Ruby Mae Dobson of Tempe. It had been celebrated 56th sitting anniversary on the 19th. Same gal. I don't know how she stood me. What they put up with in the old days especially. They moved to Mesa to begin a lifelong association with Baseline Cattle Company and Sheep Springs Sheep Company. Dobson had a great ranching history here. And I was just lucky enough to be a part of it. I uh, was farming here on baseline and my uh, brother-in-law was adjacent to me, Cliff Dobson, and uh, he got a series of illness. So I came in to help him. And finally, why we just formed a partnership. Mr. Patterson became active in both the Arizona wool growers 
and the Cattle Feeders Association, which was unheard of in many parts of the West. The sheepmen got along pretty good with the cattlemen, but they're compatible with sports, and nowadays especially. Love of sports and civic service added hours to his long days of farming and ranching. From the time he moved to Mesa, Dwight Patterson was deeply involved. His activities included serving on the Mesa Parks Board, assisting with the development of Mesa Country Club, and becoming elected president of the Mesa Junior Chamber of Commerce. He officiated at state sporting events, served as president of the Arizona Athletic Officials, and was instrumental in promoting Little League in Arizona. We had four teams, and the whole camp were the managers, coaches, uh, umpires, uh, did everything, but we only had four teams that were sponsored by four of the different uh, service clubs in town. And they got too big for us, so we had to get together with the parents and let them run. But it's a great program. It's, of course, a great program all over this country. Mr. Patterson was on the Arizona School Board Association and found time as well for the presidency of both the NAU Alumni Association and the Maricopa Community College Board. The legislature created, a, enacted a law that it was counties the right to purchase junior college from Phoenix and that money, then. and that's what they proposed to do, because it would be run by Phoenix Union High School District, and it kind of outdrew them. Yeah, I think that's a, one of the greatest things we've ever done in Arizona. It uh, opened up to so many avenues for kids to go to college, and uh, the junior college is about half uh, academic and half vocational. We've got uh, Maricopa County now has got over 80,000 students. And then they range, they're, they're, I guess the average is darn near 30 years old. It's people who want to change and the people who upgrade their, their lifestyle or uh, some of them just go in there for, because they haven't learned something. They don't get, but it's a great thing. Water conservation has been a high priority with Mr. Patterson, who has served on the Arizona Power Authority, the Board of Arizona Water Conservation, and the Federal Land Bank. In 1949, he chaired a committee to bring in a Major League Baseball team for spring training season. The Chamber of Commerce in Mesa decided it would be nice to have a team train in Arizona in Mesa. We had one in Phoenix and one in Tucson. They were the Giants, New York Giants, and the Cleveland Indians. So. We were lucky enough to secure the, in 1951, we secured the Chicago Cubs. Uh, Mr. Wrigley decided he wanted to move out of Catalina Islands, which is no place to spring train. So we made a contact, I was the chairman of the chamber committee. They were here for about 18 years. We got an offer from California, around San Diego, Escondido. And so they took that, and they went over there one year, and they came back. So the Cubs have been back here now for 14, 15 years. And the Cubs draw. I don't know why. They can't win, but they draw. But I think Arizona's future is great, better than any other state. You know, if you're going to live here, you better do, contribute something. Ladies and gentlemen, history maker Dwight Pat Patterson. You heard all about Pat. I can only tell you just one story. I, I came here in 53 and got to know him. He's worked hard for Arizona. But he calls me for lunch every once in a while. And this is a man who can, he can talk to the people, the power people. He can talk to the people in the ivory tower. And when I go to the Mesa Country Club to have lunch with him, who does he have with him? The clubhouse man for the Cubs, Yosh Kawano. So this is a man who talks to power but lives with people. And Arizona, I'm sure if you asked Pat, he'd say, Arizona's been good to me. But I'll tell you, friends, and we all know tonight, that Pat, you have been good for Arizona. Thank, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I've been lucky. I've been in the right corner or the right street all my life. Thank you very much. I've just been lucky, and I have lived, everybody, so thank you. We thank you again, and we wish you all good night.